Welcome back to Highly Respected. I'm your host, Scott Greer, and today we're going to have an incredible episode, and we're, of course, not taking the day off, even though there is a holiday today. Lee Jackson Day, of of course, is what I'm talking about. I think there's apparently some other holiday that's a federal holiday, but I don't really know anything about that. I only celebrate Lee Jackson Day around this weekend, so... Uh, whatever other holiday it is, must not be that important. But that's what, actually, we're going to talk about this other holiday today for this episode and the topic of reparations. That's going to be our first discussion because, you know, it's something that we've talked about uh, reparations before on the podcast, but not really honed in on it and discussed its potential and how, whether it's actually going to happen nationwide, what it's looking like on a state and local level. I think it's an appropriate day to talk about it since the uh, other holiday, not Lee Jackson Day, you know, the man who gave us this holiday was a supporter of reparations or would have supported it had he lived longer. And of course, I'm talking about Martin Luther King. This may be a, a bit of a news for some conservatives when they think when they hear the idea that Martin Luther King would have supported reparations it's like, no, no, he wouldn't. He was a conservative. He was a Republican. He believed in free market and he was not about this type of massive wealth redistribution. And that's just totally wrong. Martin Luther King uh, was had socialist views. I mean, it's proper to say that he was a social democrat in his views. He, I mean, at the end of his life, pretty much everything he was supporting was involved with left-wing economics. So, I mean, what he was in Memphis for was to help support a labor strike uh, done primarily by black garbage workers. He also was organizing this poor people's campaign that was going to be a march of poor people to demand more wealth redistribution. And it was also going to be race specific in that poor people's campaign because it was blacks, Indians, um, feather <laughs> Indians and Mara Indians and Hispanics coming together to demand, you know, wealth redistribution to them specifically based on the debt America owes them. And there was a New York Times column published over the weekend highlighting how Martin Luther King would have supported reparations. It looked at his speeches. It says that America owes a great debt, economic debt, not just a spiritual or metaphor, metaphorical debt or just like we're say we're sorry, it's all done. No, they actually owe a literal debt that must be paid off to blacks due to how they economically impoverished impoverished blacks so that he really felt in the last years of his life that you know the voting rights act and the civil rights act was not enough that there needed to be economic redistribution to blacks to elevate their status and that would have been some type of reparations i mean that term was not used by martin luther king but based on his politics at the time based on what he supported he would have obviously supported reparations he even implied that there should be some type of reparations for beyond America's borders, is that we should do more to elevate the poor worldwide because of our the evils of colonialism and other things. So this is like very much a legacy of Martin Luther King. I mean, he was not at all a conservative. He was not at all, uh, even though his father was a Republican, uh, the father and other family began to become Democrats in the 60s, and they supported more of the Democrats. They were institutionally more involved in the Democrats. I mean, Martin Luther King played a key role at the 1964 uh, Democratic uh, National Convention, and he was had much better relationship with uh, Democratic politicians than he did with Republican politicians. You know, he was not hanging out with Barry Goldwater, who is uh, responsible for the modern day GOP and Ronald Reagan. You know, these were not the types he was, uh, you know, he's associating with among Republicans. It's Republicans who are no longer who would not be a part of the party today, like Nelson Rockefeller. These very liberal uh, Republicans who uh, very much more resemble the modern day Democratic Party than they do anything associated with Republicans. He was not, you know, a fan of the free market and, and capitalism, or at least to the extent that the Republican Party is. He believed that government needs to restrict capitalism. And he felt that there was greed was an evil. And he felt that a lot of those money that people were earning through the free market system need to be redistributed to the poor and to black specifically. I'm using redistribution a lot here because that is what reparations is. It is a wealth redistribution scheme. 
a racial wealth redistribution scheme that's designed to take money away from whites and give it to non-whites. And that's really the best way of looking at it. It's not just simply saying that the government has this infinite supply of money and it's just, you know, it's just handing out uh, a debt that is owed to blacks. No, it's, it, it's them taxing the tax base, primarily whites, primarily white Americans. You know, they're not taxing uh, illegal immigrants. They're not taxing blacks. Blacks don't, I mean, most, the majority of blacks don't pay that much in taxes because a lot of them are are below the line, the income level to pay a lot of taxes. So it's really that we're going to raise taxes on whites, effectively redistributing their wealth to blacks in order to pay off uh, something that happened 160 years ago. So this is how they go about this thing. Now, I don't want to dwell on Martin Luther King too much. I think a lot of us know uh, the story about him. I have a whole IQ supplement on it. You can uh, go check that out at the at highly respected Substack at highly respected dot Substack dot com. It's one of the first episodes. I think it's one of the first five episodes that I did on and it's now almost two years old. But I did it on Martin Luther King and how his movement worked. But I mean, there's so many truths about Martin Luther King that it's it's a shame that we have a holiday over him. He was not necessarily a communist. Um, he did have socialist views. He did have all these former communists who were advisors to him, who were helping him out. I don't think that, he, you know, that's a little, it does show that he was a far left radical. He was not a part of, he did not have conservative views on economics or culture or society. You know, he's very much a liberal progressive on all those matters. Uh, but that's not the real thing. One thing is true is he was a serial adulterer. <laughs> He always was banging prostitutes. Any serious biography is going to mention how he's like banging prostitutes. When he went and won a Nobel Peace Prize and went to Norway, I believe this was in 64 or 65, you know, his whole entourage was excited to be banging Norwegian prostitutes and they were going nuts. It was like a rock band uh, with groupies with them, with their sexual antics of him and his whole uh, close circle, which all these guys were pastors. And they were, you know, anytime they went to a city, it's time to like, you know, it's like uh, rock stars after a concert. You know, that's how they approach these things. And they went nuts and they were seeing like some of these guys running around naked in this hotel. And the Norwegians are like, what the hell is going on? You know, and So that's one aspect that is very true about Martin Luther King that people usually attack. And he was a plagiarist. I mean, he plagiarized his doctoral dissertation. Uh, his doctoral committee was... Uh, led by white liberals and they're like oh well he can copy things he's very much a you know of this mimicry that blacks are a part of you know he would able to sound smart if you ever read any of these like very um sympathetic biographies to him which is pretty much everything you're going to read they'll be like he is so smart he would cite hegel he'd sometimes even cite nietzsche and it was like he'd just like cite things to sound smart in his voice and they're like, oh, whites are like, oh my God, he's just so smart. He's just so articulate. And that was a good way of winning over a lot of these people. Also, he's appealing to, uh, you know, Christian principles. Then he was appealing even to Declaration of Independence and some of the founding principles to push for things that were uh, very much the antithesis of what the American founders wanted. Uh, that is something to be. And I think that is a way of another way of looking at reparations is that this would have been an abominable idea to any of the men who founded this country who ever made it great. But it is appropriate now for modern America to adopt this insane idea. Now, reparations is one of these ideas that went from a fringe I, uh, con concept to a mainstream reality within about 20 years of my maybe I think it was back in the I think it became popular, right? I know it was po it was discussed a lot in the 90s, and I think it became more popular when we did reparations to the Japanese internees uh, during World War II. Those reparations were granted by Ronald Reagan in 1988. Um, <laughs> yeah, Reagan did that, and I think those claims for blacks are like, hey, what about our reparations for slavery? And it became more discussed in the 90s. As, as a kid, I remember, you know, they would have news outlets to have a discussion about this. But this was just considered a wild idea. But it's like, we'll entertain it. And blacks were talking about this in the late 90s and 2000s, early 2000s. It went away for most of the Bush years. I mean, if bringing up reparations was, was a joke 
uh, as can be seen in the Chappelle show skit that everyone knows about is like granted reparations and they all go uh, hood out for like a day and week and spend and blow all the money. It was treated as a joke. It was not treated as a serious idea for most of my lifetime. It became more serious. I mean, obviously in the wake of George Floyd, but it was already a little build up to then. Georgetown University, I think a few other universities began having a type of uh, reparation system that they were granting. I think Brown University was another where, you know, they would find evidence that slaves were involved in the building of parts of their campus or facilities, and they would try to track them down and offer those uh, descendants some type of reparation. I think with Georgetown, they gave them preference for admission to the school, and I think there was some monetary benefit for those specific descendants of those slaves uh, that they could track down and say that they were uh, that their ancestors were involved in building the university. So that was already happening before uh, George Floyd's death. I think most of this stuff was starting to happen in around 2016 and carried over uh, in the few years before George Floyd. But once George Floyd happened, it then went straight to the mainstream and everyone began demanding this. You know, Congress finally passed, or the House of Representatives passed a, uh, a legislation, uh, not legislation, but passed a, a uh, resolution to study uh, reparations, and they formed a committee. It's been it's been held up on where it's going and how far it's going and what it's doing, but they did pass the vote on it. And then all these uh, California is obviously pursuing reparations, and they're currently studying it right now. Where you're seeing, and those are going to be direct payments. Some of the forms of reparations that, and I think what's most likely to happen is they give some type of money or investment to black communities and then they just say that that's reparations evanston illinois which i can't i th think that happened immediately after george floyd or may happen even right before george floyd actually just looked actually it was right after george floyd early 2021 where they finally passed it and theirs is like housing assistance for uh, black descendants of, and specifically descendants of those who were allegedly discriminated by Evanston, Illinois, for through redlining and restricted covenants in the past, and they were able to get some type of housing assistance. Which, oh, some of the black residents were pissed off. They were like, "Hey, we we demand more. We want direct payments." And instead, they gave they're eligible for up to twenty five thousand dollars in housing assistance with. Uh, the various needs that may be met. But California is instead looking at doing direct payments, which it's going anywhere from $200,000 to a million dollars per, per, uh, per descendant. And also that there's also, they, they're restricting it to, it has to be descendants of Afri or American slaves, Africans and immigrants are not eligible for it. You have to prove that you're a descendant of someone who is held in bondage in, in American slavery. And it is funny that California is pursuing this. Actually, pretty much all the places that are pursuing some form of reparations are not in the South. We're not involved in slavery. I think Asheville, North Carolina uh, had some type of reparation, but there is is like... I remember they may be doing something new, but I remember when they first did this, it was a just saying that they're normal investment in blacks and like w w poverty schemes that they already have are now reparations uh, that they were doing this. But Asheville is a very liberal city, and that's probably one of the few places that was involved in slavery, but it also not even that much because that's in Western North Carolina and there wasn't even that many slaves in Appalachia, but. They were a member of a slave state, were part of the Confederacy. Uh, so that is one of the places. But most of the places that are pursuing this are not. Evanston, Illinois, obviously not a slave state or part of a slave state. Uh, Boston, hub of abolitionism, was not a slave state. They did have slaves. They did have a number of slaves in the colonial era. And I think their last slaves in New England, they, there was a dwindling to such a small amount that there were pretty much no slaves by the 19th century uh, that were there by the start of it. But they, you know, was not a slave state by the time of the Civil War. Uh, St. Paul, Minnesota 
another place that was you know they didn't have i mean <laughs> they didn't have slavery there this is not even like boston you know this is uh was not a part of the colonial era but they're now pursuing looking at reparations kansas city missouri a little bit interesting because you know kansas city it, i mean parts of it are in kansas but the majority of it's in missouri missouri was a slave state so that is another place you could say is um you know did have slavery also st louis is looking into this but not they of course missouri did not join the confederacy but it did have a slavery i think on the western side there wasn't as much but it's the same with like Asheville. it's it was a part of a slave state but elsewhere it's uh, mostly i mean <laughs> it's in illinois and california and even some of these states that may start pursuing it you know they were not you know they were i mean california's entrance into the union uh, help was one of the causes of the Civil War because it was admitted as a free state and now it's having to pay back for slavery. But it's not just slavery, as Evanston, Illinois makes a point. It is all the type of alleged discrimination against blacks. And they want to make it to more recent discrimination because they want to say that it's now, well, these people are still a living who experiences discrimination or their children and, and certainly their grandchildren are still living, whether it's housing discrimination or uh, vote. I mean, they'll probably start adding voting discrimination if they ever go down to the South, is that this is the reason for why they should get reparations primarily due to housing discrimination. And I think that's even what California primarily used as its justification for reparations is to do that. And even with Boston, it's um, it's a mix. I think they do, they do cite the colonial era slavery and then they do bring up the housing discrimination. So, it, which... Uh, when this is first idea was discussed back in the back in the day in the 90s and 80 and late 80s it was simply for slavery it was slavery and slavery is always the means for saying this and whenever they're you know they've had these town or these town hall meetings to discuss reparations uh, in california and it's always primarily slavery it's like they owe us a debt it's like they didn't give us any land after after freeing us and we were in chains for hundreds of years it's time to give us back this money and obviously california was involved in slavery <laughs> it was a free state but they say you know the reason the stated reason is housing discrimination but all the advocates go straight back to slavery to because it's more powerful uh, persuasion weapon to use than to simply say you know uh, restrictive covenants and redlining and reparations is not just happening in america it's also happening internationally it's like some other countries are looking to this particularly the ones that were involved in colonialism uh, you know england there's a massive push in england to have reparations church of england is now doing this type of thing that they're looking to pay back descendants of slavery but they're not calling it reparations the netherlands issued apology for slavery and colonialism but they're also facing a massive amount of pressure to do a form of reparations for that so this is not just an american idea this is an international idea of reparations which does show the international impact of george floyd i mean there were george floyd protests in in europe <laughs> there were George Floyd protests in like Eastern Europe, which still makes no sense. I mean, they were very small. I think there uh, there was a sizable one. I think in some pl like place like Prague. One of the funniest when they tried to do some in Ukraine. Uh, whatever your thoughts about Ukraine, <laughs> like the people got mad and started chasing the protesters because uh, they're like, "What the hell is this? This obviously doesn't belong here." I think in also Warsaw there was also some pro um, you know sizable protests, but it's like, why the hell are they all they protesting for George Floyd? But this whole idea of black worship and you know America state religion of black worship you know, transported itself to throughout the world. I mean, you could call it afro uh, in some way of like uh, idolatry and adding African into it and mixing it in and creating afro You could call it that. Uh, might be the best term. There's some other terms that for people, but I think afro is an appropriate term, politically correct term maybe, that you could use for it. But this uh, transported, uh, you know, throughout the world. And it's hard to deny reparations now than it was 20 years ago because of the strength of Afrolatry. I mean, we are, we would have not been a country to, you know, have a national mourning and turn someone like George Floyd into a hero. When Rodney King was beaten by LAPD, 
there was a lot of people who were pointing out this guy was high on PCP, was was dangerous, was resisting arrest, was attacking the officers. They maybe went overboard in it and in, in beating him, but this was not, you know, Rodney King was not a good dude, and people were willing to admit that. You know, you did have a few people who were willing to admit George Floyd was not a good dude, you know, particularly with conservative media, but it was not heard in the mainstream media that he was instantly turned into a martyr uh, of almost a religious stature, not of a, almost a religious stature, of a religious stature. And this was, you know, this mentality was carried throughout the world. So it can be look like that reparations is inevitable for America. I'm a little bit skeptical of making that definite of a claim, but you know, there is a point to it with how their resistance towards reparation is. The only really full-throated attack on reparations I've seen was Senator Tommy Tuberville of Alabama, who is not a particularly hardcore conservative or really strong right-wing type, who had an epic a speech about reparations at a Trump rally right before the election where he's like, you know, they want to pay reparations to the criminal and that's bullshit. And it was like a full throated like this is stupid. They're wanting to pay the people who do the crime and this is outrageous and they're trying to steal your money. And it was a major controversy when he said this. They're like, this is racist. This is race baiting. How dare he says this? But he didn't apologize. He didn't follow up on it. And um most of the GOP were like, well, we wouldn't have used those words, but we're not going to condemn him. And but that's like the first time that that's the first time a white guy, a white public figure has made a claim against reparations. I'm sure Tucker has done stuff, but that's like the first time that a politician has. Most of the time, the debate between reparations, they use black proxies for it. There was one time where they had a hearing on reparations. I think this was in 2019. And all the Republicans and, and the Democrats are like, we're it's ready to do this, whether they're white or black. It's like we need to do this. And then they had these expert opinions were saying about how they need reparations, blah, blah, blah. And for Republicans, they said absolutely nothing about it besides saying that uh, Democrats were the ones responsible for slavery, not Republicans. Uh, of course, that's what they would say. I think Louis Gohmert or one of those who said one of those types of congressmen said it. And then they had just, they're like, hey, they found random blacks to just say uh, reparations suck. And they use just them. And they're like, that's so articulate. Thank you, Mr. Black Man, for doing this. And I even was one time, this is, uh, I think, in November over Thanksgiving, I was watching a Jesse Waters segment on reparations. And generally, Jesse Waters, like whenever there's a controversial issue, you know, he tries to raise the temperature on it and make it, you know, much more entertaining and like, you know, a slug fest. But with reparations, he had these two black pastors on to have a very civil discussion on reparations about why it's bad. And they use very like careful uh, arguments against reparations that they had another black pastor say for why there shouldn't be reparations and saying like, well, it violates the code of individual responsibility. And it, you know, it doesn't solve the guilt problem. So we just need to uplift blacks through the free market. And that's essentially the argument that they made. So there's not a very good argument is that Republicans are very afraid to go to frontally attack reparations, the idea, because they don't want to be labeled a racist like Tommy Tuberville. So they're very circumspect about how they uh, criticize reparations. They have to use black proxies to do it. And they're just like, oh, there's better ways to uplift blacks than reparations. And it's um, very much pussyfooting around the issue and rather directing. And it's going to be a major issue in the 2024 campaign because Democrats are having lower black turnout in most recent elections. And a big reason that Gavin Newsom is championing reparations is because of his presidential aspirations. If he becomes a candidate in 2024, a big pitch that he's going to have is reparations is that if I become president, we're going to do reparations on a national scale like we're doing in California or we're planning to do in California. And he will do that. And even with Biden, if Biden's the nominee, he will... Uh, you know, he's probably going to sh- do make a stronger pitch for reparations in order to decrease black turnout because they are having a problem with black turnout. And this is the best way to probably do that is to promise them more money. Now, how Republicans respond is going to be interesting. I could see the main reason that some type of reparations would happen. What would happen on a national scale? Well, let me get to the point of how Republicans 
will respond. I think the disappointing factor is that you're going to see black proxies used to counter reparations. Now, if Trump is the nominee, Trump and he understands why he won in 2016 and why he was so popular throughout his presidency among the base is that he will openly challenge reparations, perhaps if he feels that it's necessary to do it in the presidential run, is that he feels that there is a silent majority out there that wants a particularly among whites who just wants to say, no, we're not paying this. This is stupid. I'm not doing this. And if he does that, that could make him uh, stand out among the pack. I don't think you would see Ron DeSantis do that. I think he'd be much more cautious. He would use black proxies. He's not. He's a very risk averse politician. If you really look at it, I mean, he takes stances that are be very popular with the base, but he does try to not go too far out like Trump did with, and especially with 2016, where Trump took a lot of risk by, you know, calling for a Muslim ban. Uh, the things he said about immigrants, the things he said about John McCain. He really goes out there on a limb, not calculated, you know, not calculating the pill for us. He just says stuff that he thinks that it's going to be popular with the base, and it turns out to be popular with the base, but it's a very controversial thing to say that. DeSantis really doesn't go further out onto the off the plantation of what acceptable discourse, and people, he doesn't seem to need to because people think he's like way more hardcore than Trump uh, by just sticking within those perimeters. So I think with Trump would probably do, say something about it, but it would be that most Republicans would still be very hesitant to criticize this, even though Democrats are going to be running on this issue. And it's probably even going to be raised in debates when they're going to ask, like, what do you think about reparations? And Republicans are going to have to give some milk toast response like, well, we owe a debt to blacks or whatever, but this is not the way to do it. And as they'll just cite like black people like Ben Carson and Tim Scott tell me it's not the way to do it. And they'll do that. But I think Trump would have the guts to say something on it when they do. But I think in the next, uh, with barring some radical change in how America's um, Afro lottery uh, goes about, we're probably going to do some form of reparations. Because from this standpoint, going forward, you know, America is just obsessed with worshiping blacks, with doing whatever they want to do and like acceding to their demands and believing that all of our history is centered around them. I mean, 1619 Project and all that stuff is going to make a bit more of an influence on young people's minds in both college and in primary school. They're going to have a effect. There is going to be this thing that we need. We owe a massive debt. They made us America. They're the true Americans. So we might as well give them reparations and rap songs will be about that. NFL will probably be doing pro rep. You know, these players will start doing rep pro reparation statements and the type of entertainment and celebrity world that they follow will make this a more popular idea. And it's over time, there has been growing popularity of reparations. I mean, now polls show that a majority of Democrats support reparations the first time this year, and they even show a slight number of Republicans being more supportive of this idea under the wrong assumption that if they just give blacks reparations, that this whole problem will go away, which <laughs> absolutely not. They'll just demand more, more and more and more. It's it's a huge issue. And if we ever did reparations, that's a that's a real damning indictment of America, as I said in a recent podcast on on the topic. It's it's a real like it's over moment for America if we do this. I think in the next 10 years or so, the Congress, it might even be sooner, depending on how well Democrats do in presidential elections and, and elections this decade, is that Republicans will agree to a type of reparations. They will not be direct payments. We can't afford direct payments. And I think when California tries to do direct payments, it's going to be a massive disaster. And that is going to help the anti-reparations side is when they do this is that, you know, it's going to cripple. It's going to cripple California. It's going to be a complete fuck up when they do it. What they're going to do is they're going to do some type of investment, a greater investment in the black community. And they're just going to call it reparations. And maybe they can convince Republicans to support it if they put something in the bill acknowledging Democrats supported slavery in the antebellum era. And that's how they come to that agreement that there's more reparations. But it's it's never going to be solved. Like no matter how much more money you put, push, put in the black community, it's never going to be enough. I mean, even over time, our welfare programs, 
affirmative action, uh, even the type of culture we now have that's centered around, you know, praising blacks and treating them as magical beings. All of this can be seen as a form of reparations, especially with affirmative action and especially with the massive amount of money we spend on schools and, 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 and poverty programs that are largely used by blacks. You know, we've already been doing reparations and it's done jack shit. Reparations is just shoveling more money down the toilet and hoping for a different result. And so it's insane. Um, hopefully, I'm hoping Republicans do switch on their attitude towards this and rather than using black proxies is that they openly confront this idea and refute it as an idiotic, insane idea that it's a massive racial wealth redistribution scheme that's not going to solve anything. It's just going to throw money down the toilet and confiscate wealth from whites to give to blacks over um, long gone um, injustices. I don't think, I think it, I'm hoping that there is a change but I don't see that change in the moment, but it could happen in the 2024 presidential election. This could be one of those meta political moments that makes it exciting. Again, I don't see DeSantis doing it, but I do see I think Trump still has it in him to call it out and challenge it. But in concluding statement, a little bit of a black pill, but it's not a black pill. It's a clear pill. Unless America's Afro Lottery changes in a direction or we see that all the reparations programs are such massive failures that even Democrats are like, uh, maybe we shouldn't try this on a national level. If all trends continue going the way they are, you could very well see a reparations program done at the national level. I don't think it will be direct payments. We can't afford it. And even if, no matter what happens with California, it's going to be a disaster and they're going to say something else. They'll just call some investment program or you know new money for black communities or the poor and they'll just say that's reparations. And uh, depending on how much uh, control Democrats have over the legislature or whether Republicans are duped into thinking this is a way to win over the black vote, you could see something like that happen. Now back to the subject of MLK. Uh, Boston, we mentioned Boston as well. Boston unveiled a new MLK statue. It's supposed to be the embrace. It's supposed to be based on a picture of Greta Scott King and Martin Luther King embracing. Uh, but it's hard to see if that's what it's depicting. It, depending on the angle, it looks like uh, two har arms holding up a massive dong or a massive turd or something else inappropriate. <laughs> anyway, the, the sculpture, which they spent millions of dollars on, looks very inappropriate. But I think it's an appropriate statue for Martin Luther King to have this abomination and monstrosity represent him. I think it's finally we get a worthwhile statue for Martin Luther King, and it's all its ugly postmodernism that happened. So everyone's like, uh, you know... <laughs> having a joke about this or laughing about this and seeing it. But the conservatives decided to use this as a political issue and saying that this is a sign of how modernism and postmodernism are bad. And we prefer traditional statues of Martin Luther King. So all these conservatives now decided that the black power statue of Martin Luther King with his arms crossed, you know, him looking like, you know, not please and you know, him angry and, and assertive in Washington, D.C. is now the traditional statue. And they're like, we're, we're old school. We prefer this statue over this woke garbage. And that's now the conservative position in <laughs> for Martin Luther King is that this. And so there's all these arguments like this is a disgrace to Martin Luther King. This is outrageous that they would do this. Uh, this is a uh, I think I saw Sagar and Jetty say that this modernism is out of control, which he's, he didn't get the memo. He's supposed to put a post in front of that modernism. It's supposed to be postmodernism, not modernism, uh, that he's attacking and to be in line with most conservatives. And so they're going along with this, and it kind of just shows, I think that the correct position is saying, this is an appropriate statue for Martin Luther King. This is, this is uh, we want him to be associated with ugliness, not anything inspiring or powerful, and to not be a fan of the, uh, I, I find the D.C. statue more aggravating than this. I mean, the Boston statue makes me laugh. The D.C. statue uh, makes me grimace. And this stuff, but the conservatives now think that that's the real conservative statues that our struggle is against postmodernism that even attacks the our dear conservative Martin Luther King and, and strikes him down and, and doesn't positively portray him. And I think it's just it's just kind of a silly debate that they're having. And people don't really have the language or means to decide why they don't like this statue or 
or why they shouldn't like Martin Luther King. They just kind of jump on board and try to appropriate him and go to the next issue that they're trying to, you know, combat and say that this is, we won't go past this point, but then we'll retreat to another point. Going along with that, there was a, uh, you know, this point that like conservatives don't really have, that they really just have like a way of combating the standard news line or the whatever the news story is going on in the media. And there's not a real depth of principle going on here. That's the same with the Martin Luther King is that they have to have a position on this. And the position they're going to take is this is a showing how postmodernism is out of control. and We need to return to traditional Martin Luther King statues to honor American heroes. And that's now the new conservative position and also believing that Martin Luther King is conservative. There's now going to be a position where there's going to be support among conservatives for the LGBT, LGB, not the T and LGBT and the all the new stuff. And that's now going to be the conservative position as well. And similar in how they have adopted Martin Luther King, they'll adopt uh, the old traditional gay rights as their thing. There is this group called Gays Against Groomers. I don't know really what they do. They have a Twitter account. I think they may have an Instagram account, but they posted this thing. It's like reject modernity and it's the new gay pride flag with like all the trans stuff and the black and brown stuff and all this sort of nonsense. And it's like embrace tradition. It's the gay, it's the old gay pride flag. And some of this may have been just like being a joke, but that is like unironically the American rights position is like now, and they always defend these LGB, LGB people who are anti-T, um, well, anti-trans, not the anti-T and anti-testosterone, but maybe they're anti-T in that as well. And that's always their stance is when they find people to react against uh, the transgender stuff. They go to feminists and they go to gays to be their defense against it, and, and particularly lesbians as their defense against uh, the trans stuff. And that's usually what the argument they're going with in the same way that they have to have find black proxies to attack reparations they're now leaning on feminists and gays and lesbians to go against the transgender position so it's something interesting that they said that like and gays against groomer is a popular conservative account now um you know that would that's a huge change from 10 years ago i mean conservatives would have liked the martin luther king statue 10 years ago 20 years ago 20 years ago 30 years ago it might have been a little bit more uh, of a dispute for them to like it, and especially 40 and 50 years ago. I mean, they did not like uh, Martin Luther King. So it's been, a, it's been a change over time, but much more longer period of time of change than the gay stuff. But they just kind of go to the next position, and it's really more defined by, you know, they have always said about being against the current thing, and they use that against to mock like right-wing Twitter and dissonance. But Really, there's this conservative stance of being against just liberals or whatever the liberal current position is. And they feel the best argument is to adopt, is to take over the trench of the old liberal position and then uphold that as tradition and what they're standing for. And you can see that now with the Martin Luther King is that now we're defending the old traditional statues of Martin Luther King versus the postmodernist statues. And we're defending the traditional gay pride flag against the new, even woker gay pride flag. And it, it's it's all, it's really uh, silly and embarrassing, but it's typical for conservatives that the, the guiding fixation is just to own the libs by exposing how they're not upholding their old standards or they're not even upholding their new standards and it's just about owning the libs for on based on liberal standards rather than upholding any type of deeply cherished principles that they may have now going on to another topic it's the decline in patriotism among americans particularly young americans a new morning consult poll found that only 16% of Zoomers, Gen Zers, say they're proud to be Americans, and 36% of Millennials say they're proud to be Americans. A majority of Boomers and Gen Xers still say they're proud to be Americans. 54% of Gen Xers say they're proud to be Americans, and 72% of Boomers say the same. So that's a massive difference between Boomers and Gen Zers. And so why are they not proud to be Americans? And Morning Consult explains why. 
It says Gen Z adults are 18 to 25 years old, a formative age for political views. For today's Zoomers, COVID-19 lockdowns, social unrest, and graphic images of police brutality may be causing them to abandon a sense of American exceptionalism relative to older cohorts, especially in terms of respect for civil liberties at home compared with less democratic countries. If younger Americans think the United States is just one of many countries that regularly represses civil rights, as our corresponding survey question states, then this would explain why they hesitate to boycott companies for operating in what they see as similar environments overseas. As the adage goes, he who lives in a glass house should not throw stones. Gen Z adults have much lower trust in U.S. government institutions than older generations. They are also more likely than other cohorts to say they are proud to live in the United States. And so it goes on. And yeah, it's, so the main reason that they don't like America is for left wing reasons. It's not for right wing reasons. And the survey they were fine referring to is uh, something I tweeted out. It was also part of this uh, survey that uh, Morning Consult did is that young consumers are less interested in certain aspects of global corporate purpose. And really what they found is that younger consumers care far more uh, if a company supports BLM, abortion access, uh, you know, gay rights stuff and even this type of matter is that they that they are stay within, you know, that they are a uh, so for pro social causes, even though all Americans say, even though a large number, 60 percent of Gen Z adults who were surveyed said that they want a company, they want a comp they want to know a company supports the U.S. military, which is a rather um, not that woke of a position, even though maybe now maybe <coughs> they may now. I think that is, but they do care more if they're like found out they're anti-gay or restrict abortion access, but they do not give a shit if a company operates in China or another repressive country. They don't care, which is very funny, which that's very different from boomers and others, and especially Gen Xers. Gen Xers care the most that they are operating in a country that represses civil liberties and all those type of things like China. And that makes sense because Gen Xers seem to be the main uh, producers of all these conservative takes complaining about corporations, woke corporations working in China and other where in other places like that to say, well, why are they being so woke here when they're not, uh, you know, you know, up holding up their values overseas? Well, that's uh, there's a reason. But that argument is falling on deaf ears when it comes to Gen Zers and millennials. They don't give a shit. They care far more about if a company is publicly in favor of BLM than if they use uh, sweatshop labor in China. That's how they, they go about this. The poll underscores a point I've been making a lot about how the right and left treat America. The left is more openly anti-America than ever before, even though the, the America that they live in is more aligned with their wishes and desires. While the right stays more pro-America, maybe a little bit not so much as it was 20 years ago, but it's still very pro-America, even though the America that they live in resembles more of their nightmares and the opposite of their wishes and desires. And so this is reflected in how Gen Z is, is that even though America is more woke, more multicultural, more diverse, more celebratory of blacks and other non-whites, and it now teaches about how America is founded by non-whites and all the whites are villains. All the the only thing that these younger Americans take from this is that America is an evil country. It represses minorities. It doesn't respect civil rights. Uh, and by civil rights, they don't mean free speech because also Gen Zers and other polls show that they have greater support for hate speech laws and censorship. So they don't have support for those civil rights about your right to free speech and other things. But they do think that Civil rights is just how well you treat non-whites, and they believe that this is a white supremacist hellhole that is regularly, regularly kills blacks with, without any consequence, which is, of course, not true. And so this is actually a big problem for America. I think I saw a few right-wingers who were like, well, I agree, there's nothing to really be proud about America, but it's like, well... That that's not our reasons for not being uh, for being having a uh, dismal picture of the current America are very different from Gen Zers. We think that our country is too woke, are too are too obsessed with blacks, are too obsessed with the civil rights legacy, and doesn't acknowledge the impact that foundational Americans made to this country and, and is very anti-white and, you know, it just wants to portray us as villains. And, and it just says 
that for conservative whites, there's no place for you in the new America. And that's why people would have a dismal picture of the current America. But that's not shared with these people who are rating their patriotism very low. It's that it's it's not woke enough. America is not woke enough for their interests. And this is being encouraged by education. So it's funny that they're building up a new America, a new type of patriotism to be for the multi, you know, the new multicultural diverse America. But it's not it's not translating into any pride among these young people. It's instead translating into apathy or hostility. And that is going to be a major issue if we need if we go into a war, we need our young people to fight because we can't rely on Gen Gen Xers to fight our wars. I mean, they're all too old for uh, the draft. They're all all too old for the draft and even to enlist. And even that's the case with millennials is for a lot of millennials now. It's really dependent on the Gen Zers and if they're all unpatriotic and unwilling to serve. And also the willingness to serve among Gen Zers is also very low too compared to previous generations. Uh, and as it's translated into military recruitment numbers of being at extremely low levels. I don't know how that that's that is going to be a, a major problem for you know our defense readiness going forward. Now, some people may say that's good. You could argue that it's good that you have a weakened military, but it does create a it does create a bit of a national security issue. And whether that can be treated as a good or bad thing remains to be ter- determined. But it, it does become a national security issue. And so it, another point I want to say that it affirms another Greer had talking point. I know I've been saying a lot of this topic. Some people get mad about me going over the same topics over again. But, you know, it's worth repeating. The lack of patriotism among Gen Zers does create the grounds for a radical left to emerge, a serious radical left to emerge. As these people are not motivated by patriotism, they're not loyal to the American system as is. They feel that they have no stake in the American system. They feel they have no stake in this country, and this country is rotten at its core. And that creates the grounds for more radical left rather than a radical right. I don't think any of these kids who think that America is too racist are going to be joining the far right. They're going to be joining the radical left. And that that is, you know, it's not, you know, a lot of what we say and some of my points people take across is that everything's just going to continue to remain the same. It's going to still get more cringe and a little bit worse, but the economic system is going to remain the same. There's not going to be anything interesting to happen uh, on the political front. I that is not my argument. My main argument is there is are really the central argument I want to get across in recent days. And I do feel this is, is kind of a white pill because it will create interesting conditions for the real right to emerge and to have a greater say in America and more people come to our side is that this radical left is going to happen. It's guaranteed that there it's going to be reflected in more Democratic parties because if you look at how the economy is working, if you look at the growing number of service sector workers and growing number of these people who have no tie-ins and no future and no prospects, and if you look at the rates of patriotism among young people, that means a radical left is going to emerge from that subset. And the greater diversity, greater multiculturalism in America does not mean there's going to be a greater commitment to civic nationalism. It's going to mean a more openness towards the type of radical socialism we see in Latin American countries and this wanting a massive wealth redistribution scheme and wanting to be more anti-white and wanting to bring a downfall to the capitalist system. Some people may like that last point, but by downfall capitalism, they really primarily hate capitalism because they see it as a tool to enrich white people and as white supremacy rather than a tool that breaks down people and and it allows for mass migration. And the reasons that the right would have its qualms with capitalism, that is not shared by the left. And so when you look at these numbers, that is the, what you really should see is the two things is that even though America is more like the America the left wants, they're becoming more anti-America, more open about that. And two, this type of this lack of patriotism is going to make those young people more open to appeals from the radical left. And that's already seen. If you look at what the popular political commentators among 
young people are. I mean, there are a few right wingers who get across to him. I mean, you could say Andrew Tate, even though now everyone on Twitter hates Andrew Tate. That's another topic beyond this uh, podcast. But if you look at all the commentators that there are, they're like really like Hassan Piker. They really like Vouch. They like a lot of those guys like that. And they're streamers. And those guys have huge audiences. Uh, and a lot of those people are young people and they all like say fuck America like burning flags uh, did you know this posturing over the Queen's death even though that has nothing to do with patriotism but that is a reflection of their hostility towards traditional symbols of Western civilization and Western nations and that's just going to continue on I don't see that reversing especially with the education system being more rife with critical race theory than ever before and the right not having a real alternative to it besides just returning to 90s era Clinton liberalism, American civic nationalism. And, but I, I think it does create the opportunities. I don't, you don't want to move back to a civic nationalism. You don't want to do that because it'll just lead to cringe America continuing on forever and ever. You, I, I actually, there is an argument for some of that critical race theory to get in there so these people don't buy into cringe America and instead they want a more radical version of America that will threaten the white middle class and will make the white middle class wake up from their complacency to see the world as is and to change their mindset. So that is my conclusion on that. Now on to the Cotton kind of Elite questions. As a reminder, you too can get the power to ask me questions if you sign up and suggest show topics and guest suggestions if you sign up for the highly respect or the kind of elite option at highly respected.substack.com and that's at highly respected.substack.com to make give you a reminder and if you haven't already make sure to sign up for the iq supplements while you're there so we have two questions today and actually there are three questions but two different people ask them and the first comes from with a twofer and as a reminder you can ask as many questions as you want if you sign up for this option so tony asked two questions and i'll answer his first his first question is asking for my opinion on the gas stove ban that the that the uh democrats are are suggesting and what are my thoughts on it and the conservative response to it so a Biden official last week suggested that we should ban gas stoves because they're a pollutant and dangerous for people. And that set off conservatives to uh, create memes saying, uh, come and take it. And it's their gas stove oven. And they're just like, this is what we're fighting for. And this is like an important thing that they, everyone must rally behind. I mean, some of the stuff that memes, I think what the DeSantis press conference where he held it up, is like, hey, check out our signs. In Florida is where woke comes to die. And it's like his like uncharismatic, just like hopping on this stuff. It's so corny. Uh, DeSantis is just undeniably corny, which is like something very different from Trump. But outside of that, I don't think it's that cringe of a response because it does represent a, even the suggestion of it represents a war on middle class living is that people view this as a perk of making it in the middle class is that it's a higher quality uh, oven and, and stovetop than electric uh, than electric alternatives. People want this and they view this as like them taking away something that they like for no other purpose than it's you know it's inefficient it's it's pollutant and it's a war on middle class the middle class is that they how they interpret it and your quality of life and it really does connect people because it's something that is in a lot of people's kitchens and they don't want the government to take that away we're very different from europe where europeans will sometimes be okay with this stuff like okay sure we'll we'll be fine with the government change to this we'll be fine with the government lowering our temperatures requiring a lowering of our temperatures of heating during the winter and a, and a raising of our temperatures during the AC, or during the summer or we won't even have air conditioning you know and the liberals suggest these uh, ideas about banning air conditioning and all this stuff for pollutants but this is all about our how people perceive as a war on their lifestyle and a war on their quality of life and it does connect with people even though some of the memes sound very corny and it sounds like it's unimportant it's way more important than conservative outrages over you know mr potato head or aunt jemima or these other things like people actually do care about uh the gas stoves they're not it's not a civil war moment, but it is does represent something that's like they're taking away our quality of life. You can change you can compare this to the battle over the incandescent light bulb. 
This was a big thing in the Obama era, and unfortunately Biden has brought it back that they're trying to phase out incandescent light bulbs and take away another quality of life and force us to have those ugly white lights that are like hospitals or it's like just a sickly atmosphere. That's something that actually really makes me mad is like, you know, incandescent lights are a quality of life. You know, it's like sets of mood. It's much better lighting. And they want us to have shitty lights that make us look like we're in a opera in a hospital operating room. And there's like something sick going on when we have those shitty white lights going that are that are more prominent among the alternatives to incandescent lights. And they want us to move from that. It's like it's a quality of life thing. And people, you know, it sounded like corny and minor that conservatives get so worked up about it. But it is a quality of life issue. And this does matter to, con, you know, the average person more than some of the other outrages we go on. Because it's like, you know, if you go and buy a light bulb and you only have like these shitty light bulbs that which they're supposed to ban it later this year. Hopefully um, there's some better alternatives. So it's not where not stuck in a whole country full of like uh, hospital <laughs> lighting. And uh, that really does set off your mood. It's like a terrible mood if you're like just sitting there at night and you're like, fuck, this sucks. <laughs> it's like just sounded surrounded in that terrible sickly light. Uh, but if you go, it is, a, it is a war on quality of life issue. And it's like, if you're somebody who's not that political and you realize like, you know, they have to send some government worker to take away your gas stove and replace it with an inferior product. And, you know, you want to go and get the light bulbs you like and the store is out of them. And instead you have to stuck stick with the shitty light bulbs that make your room look like shit uh, using shit twice, but makes, you know, gives a horrible vibe to your living room. You know, that impacts you. And it's like, why the fuck did the government make my uh, lower my quality of life? And so these quality of life issues do matter to people. And I, I do understand why conservatives gravitate towards them. And there are losers for Democrats when people are aware of them. Anything that is going to directly impact your life and make it worse in a way, and people understand that, that hurts the opposition when they're made aware of that, if that's the party that's pushing this. So I agree with the, the points of it. Uh, maybe a little bit overboard with how you talk about it. I don't know how you can talk about this issue for a whole hour which some conservatives, that's all they've been talking about is the gas stove ban <laughs> all the time. But I understand where it's coming from. It does. It is a war on quality of life and it's a war on middle class standards or middle class lifestyle that they expect. And instead, the government is coming in and telling you you can't do this for environmental reasons or whatever. So that's the answer to the first question. The second question is asking for my thoughts on the Biden documents and how this will impact Trump and the Trump investigation. That's an interesting question because, you know, there have been all this like it's unprecedented Trump would keep classified documents in his house and or his uh, residence. And then it turns out Biden has a ton of these classified documents in his home. And the only argument they have for Biden is that, well, Biden willingly turned these over while Trump uh, withheld them. And thus, that's a serious felony uh, while Biden is not. That's like saying that you know, you know, the crime is withholding these classified documents. It's not how you turn them in. That's like saying that, well, this guy killed someone, but he turned in the murder weapon. So that's not a crime. Well, this guy hit it. That's a real felony. That's that's the argument they're making. It's the same crime. It doesn't matter whether you turn it over or not. The crime has already been there. And you can just say, I forgot about it. Trump can also say that as well, is that he forgot about this. And Biden's held on to these far longer than Trump. Now, the real difference is that Biden is the current president and Trump is not. And also the <laughs> the bigger difference is that Biden is a Democrat president <laughs> and Trump is not. And, you know, this is being overseen by his own Justice Department. They got a special counsel for it, but it's likely a liberal special counsel. Now, the whether this will lead to charges for Biden, I, I doubt that. But it's more about how it will impact the federal, the investigation in Trump and the documents. I think if this investigation of Trump had been left into Garland's hands and this stuff about Biden had come out, then, yeah, I think they would have just not pressed charges on that. And the document stuff is the one thing that they really have Trump dead to rights on that they have the best case on. The stuff around J6, I think, is a little bit murkier territory. That's really what they want to charge him over. And J January 6th Commission recommended criminal charges dealing with that. I think that they are going to have a tougher time uh, proving that. 
And this document dump does give some hope that, you know, they may see that what's going on with Trump and all these are political investigations. They, they are impacted by political happenings and what ha and those things. And Garland is really worried about the impropriety of, you know, charging one presidential candidate while letting another presidential candidate off the hook for the ex same exact offense. But whether the special counsel falls along as dictates, it's uh, up in the air. But I think that the the documents uh, revelation with Biden does give hope that Trump will not be indicted. I think that they are they are sensitive to that charge that they're you know that this is acting as a political investigation that this is just trying to take out the presidential Republican presidential candidate uh, on behalf of Biden on behalf of the Democratic president and the likely Democratic presidential nominee in 2024 when they both did the same offense. I think it does help Trump out from being indicted on that. Now, it doesn't impact a possible indictment over January 6th. But as I said earlier, I think that they have the better case over the documents while it's going to be a hard, much harder case over J6. So I think this does lower the chances that Trump gets indicted by a bit, that they might actually not do it, that they may say, like, whatever, um, I still think it's a more, more than likely scenario. I think it's more than 50% chance that they do this. And we'll see. I have to see how it plays out. But it definitely does, does change the political uh, situation. Now, when it comes to Biden, uh, you know, this wasn't answered in the question or asked in the question. But I think it's worth pro, uh, assessing is whether how this affects Biden's presidential campaign or his, pre, or his chances in 2024 or whether he'll run again. And I do think that this is a little weird that they do this right after the presidential, uh, not at the presidential election, right after the midterm elections, that they have this whole dump on on Biden, and they've spent the you know, months attacking and castigating Trump for doing the exact same thing, and now they're having to defend Biden for this. And depending on how these investigations go, it's going to be harder for Biden to run. And I think there could be that some of the reason that they're doing this document dump is to you know put more pressure on Biden to not run again. And there's going to be more revelations coming from these House committee investigations and Hunter Biden and other things dealing with Joe Biden. And there may just be so much pressure on Biden and what's happening that he may not run again. There's been chance, there's been instances of this. I mean, nobody would have ever thought in, no, in 1967 that Lyndon B. Johnson would not run again. And then he turned out to not run again due to how the Vietnam War was going and the unpopularity of that. I and mean, this is a little bit different situation, but there could be so many changes over the next year and revelations about Biden's business dealings and what other, you know, federal offenses he may have committed, you know, and, and oversights he may have done, that this may just have a gradual buildup that they're like, we would rather have another uh, person as our nominee rather than Biden. I, I think it's a little bit too early to say because the, on the one hand, I say that, but on the other, I have to remember is that re going back to 2020, this is like April 2020, is that there was all these sexual misconduct allegations. There was these strong sexual misconduct allegations against Biden. And everyone at that time was talking about how Biden may drop out, that they may force Biden out and go with uh, Andrew Cuomo, <laughs> of all people, as their new nominee, because Andrew Cuomo was very popular at the time. Now, Assessing that from early 2023, that sounds absolutely ridiculous that anyone would have made this suggestion. But people were writing articles about this in mainstream publications. There was a ton of speculation that this would happen. And then just, you know, a year later, everyone realized how ridiculous this was because uh, Cuomo had to deal with his own sexual misconduct allegations and Biden became president. And so we could be looking back on this. I mean, it does ex would expose a huge double standard, but it's not like Democrats really care about having double standards. It's just all about in their favor. But I do think that there's going to be more problems for Biden over the next year and revelations against Biden that are going to be of a similar nature to these doc document revelations and them finding these documents. And it's going to be a, a tougher sell for him in 2024 if he wants to run as president. And also he has the health problems and he's, can't you know string sentences together and he's going more senile there's going to be massive problems for biden and 
you could interpret the stuff around the documents as a push by the institutions and the system to push uh, Biden out and hope that another Democratic nominee arises. And I still think the best position to take the, or to be the nominee, if it's not Biden, is, uh, is Gavin Newsom. So those are my thoughts on those questions. But I'll next move on to our, our final Cotton Elite question. And the last question comes from Jay, and he asked, he was wondering about the competency of the American system, you know, the military and all these government institutions. And he was citing the example of the FFA outage uh, because of computer failure. Does this example of FFA, FAA, I kept saying FFA, FAA outage because of computer failure provide a preview of the future? What is your feeling about competence to maintain infrastructure? Will it be an important factor or not really? I think it is, a, you know, for when it comes to government institutions and infrastructure, yes, there is going to be a competence problem going forward. You know, what if for the military, it's a little bit different because our military, if we can looking even at Russia's military, which is supposed to be one of the few serious militaries in the country and their massive problems in Ukraine. And you have I, I can already hear people going like, well, they're winning now again, but they've had a lot of problems in this war and a lot of competency issues and a lot of errors. I mean, yeah, they've had some wins and they've had a lot of losses, but. Uh, the expectations of how the Russian military would steamroll through Ukraine have turned out to be not be true. And compared to the U.S. military to other militaries, I think even China would have the same issues. And so would every other serious military is that we still are the strongest military power in the world. And despite some of our incompetence with the military, especially outside of the uh, branches we expect to kill people are the important MOSs and services that we have, you know, the Air Force uh, special forces, uh, you know, the elite infantry units, I think those are still very highly competent. But when it maybe comes to leadership and logistics and the other departments, you know, there's probably some competency issues there. But compared to the rest of the other militaries in the world, we're still at the top. Whether people want to admit that or not, uh, we're still the best military in the world. No one else can challenge us. I don't, I don't even think China can. And, and Russia really can't buy what we're seeing in Ukraine. But when it comes to other government agencies that actually depend, we depend on, you know, <laughs> transportation, anything that's overseen by the transportation secretary. Yes, we are going to have more of these incompetence because they can attract competent people to these agencies and these systems that we depend on. And there, you know, there's this diversity push where it's like we want more of these uh, DMV ladies in charge. And this is even going into the private sector. I think a lot of these uh, plant fires we've been seeing is more of a competency issue. Some people are like, they're intentionally trying to starve us, which we have not had any starvation things. I think that what happened is that a lot of the people who were in charge of maintaining these factories and plants retired after uh, 2020 and the COVID. And then they put in, you know, diversity hires or whoever else to run these plants. And they're not as competent as the people they replaced. Thus, we're getting a lot of plant fires. And I think it is going to be a major issue going forward. I mean, it's not going to be to the extent where people are starving or there's major infrastructural problems, but there will be issues that just like blackouts happen. And it's like, why the blackout happened? Because some idiot didn't do what was expected at the energy station or where or whoever's control of that. And it's especially the same with flight travel. I mean, travel is a nightmare now if you if you want to fly by plane. You know, there's so many cancellations. I mean, even the outage followed, you know, Southwest canceling all these flights for various reasons. I think it's going to, there's going to be more of a hassle when you have to fly, when you have to depend on public transportation at all. There's going to be a greater degree of incompetence, more like idiotic accidents. And so it will be a factor. And it could... You know, it's definitely going to impact the quality of life that Americans have. And in the same way that, you know, they're trying to ban gas stoves and incandescent lights impact the quality of life in that, you know, if you want to use the, you know, the subway, I know most people don't use the subway because there's very few urbanites here. We hate those urbanites. But if you wanted to use the subway, it's going to be more of a pain in the ass. You're going to have to wait much longer. I think one of the things is funny is that People comparing our subway systems and, you know, American cities to European cities. And they're like, oh, it's so bad. I had to wait five minutes for a train the other day. And, and, and people were saying this even like Ukraine that's under it's in a war zone. 
And they're like, oh, I had to wait five minutes. And it's like, uh, in America, sometimes you have to wait 25 to 30 minutes. And that's like normal <laughs> for, a, for a train. And it's like slow moving. And there's like all these uh, idiotic accidents that happen. I even in D.C., like pretty much the entire uh, staff who are running the uh, D.C. metro system are black. And maybe you could infer that there's some incompetence coming from that uh, factor, but you would see that even further because, I mean, most of these agencies that really our infrastructure depends on are also the most eager to do diversity hires and just hire people based on the color of their skin rather than their competence or merit. And that's going to lead to a uh, decline in quality of life for people who depend on this infrastructure. So I don't think it's going to impact America's at least for now, in the last 10 years, I don't think it's going to impact our ability to be the strong empire, global empire, but it will lead to a decline in the quality of life. And in the same way that the, the computer outages is like you're expecting to travel and you can't because these idiots can't figure out a computer problem. And that's the type of things. If you like wanted to travel, you're going you're gonna to have to wait five hours for you to get on a plane. Those are the types of things that you're going to see living in a modern American life is that you know, in other countries, maybe in Europe, that are not global powers, they don't really have to deal with these issues, you know, when it comes to transportation. They have energy problems, obviously, but that's more due to their own idiotic policies of getting rid of uh, trying to move to more environmentally friendly policies and getting rid of their nuclear energy and other things. I think that, yeah, when it comes to those issues, yeah, it's going to lead to quality of life. Now it could lead to disasters when it comes to like nuclear power plants and stuff and the people trying to run them. I think there's always that argument that people don't want to use nuclear power, don't want to go to nuclear power because we don't have the human capital to safely maintain it. I think that's a compelling argument that people would make. And that could lead to actual disasters versus like, you know, the idiots at a normal power station just like, oh, they hit the wrong switch and like powers off for a day <laughs> in a city. I mean, it's a, it's a massive annoyance, but it's not a um, civilizational disaster. So when it comes to the factor, I think it's the things you're going to see over the next 10 years. It's going to be mark a decline in quality of life and expectations for what for the type of life you would you live, and that you can't expect to you know your plane to arrive on time and to depart and to arrive on the time it's expected at your the point you're going to. Those issues are going to be more common in the next 10 years. But will it impact America's ability to be a global superpower? Um, I don't think so in the next 10 years, but over 20 to 30 years, I think it will. So that's my answer to that question. Hopefully that suffices to answer um, or to explain my position on the competence level of our institutions and how they can maintain present order. So that's it for today's Highly Respected. We're going to have another incredible IQ supplement later this week, so make sure to tune into that. And we should have another Highly Respected column that will be free to all all highly respected fans at the Substack. Make sure to sign up for the Substack, even if you're not signing up for the IQ supplement option to be a paid subscriber. Do You can sign up to be a free subscriber to be get the latest column, highly respected column, delivered to your inbox. So make sure to sign up for that. So until next time, stay respected.